Good afternoon, and welcome to the Sustainable Materials Management Webinar Series, a joint effort between the National Recycling Coalition and the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center. My name is Wayne Bowen, and I am the Program Manager for the Recycling Market Center, and I will serve as your moderator today. We would like to extend a special thanks to Bob Hollis of the Mobius Network for providing the webinar management software for this series, and Lisa Ruggiero of the National Recycling Coalition for providing technical support. The subject of today's webinar is recycled materials and highway construction and maintenance projects. We have two excellent speakers today, Craig Benson and Barry Cogburn. Following their presentations, we will conduct a question and answer session. Please use the GoToWebinar dialog box located in the control panel on your screen. You may also use the dialog box to request assistance if you're experiencing technical difficulties during the webinar. And now I'd like to introduce our first presenter. Craig H. Benson is a co-director of the Recycled Materials Resource Center. He is a distinguished professor of civil, environmental, and geological engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and serves as chairman of the Department of Geological Engineering. Dr. Benson has a BS from Lehigh University and an MSc and PhD degrees from the University of Texas at Austin. All of his degrees are in civil engineering with the MSE and PH degrees specializing in geoengineering. Dr. Benson is a licensed professional engineer. For the last 20 years, Dr. Benson has been conducting experimental and analytical research in geoenvironmental geo engineering, including various aspects related to the reuse of industrial byproducts in civil and geotechnical engineering. This research has included laboratory studies, large-scale field experiments, and computer modeling. Dr. Benson has received several awards for his work, including the Presidential Young Investigator Award from the National Science Foundation and the Distinguished Young Faculty Award from the U.S. Department of Energy. Dr. Benson has also received the Huber Research Prize, as well as the Crows, Middlebrooks, Collingwood, Casa Grande Awards from the American Society of Civil Engineers, Dr. Benson is a member of the ASCE Geo Institute and is former editor in chief of the ASCE GI Journal of Geotechnical and Geoenvironmental Engineering. He currently serves on the ASCE Board of Governors and the Executive Committee of ASTM Committee D18 on Soil and Rock. Dr. Ben Benson is also a founding member of ASTM Subcommittee D18.14 on Geotechnics of Sustainable Construction. And welcome, Greg. I'm going to talk to you today about a couple of things that are coming both from the Recycled Materials Resource Center and the Office of Sustainability in our campus. So I actually no longer am a co-director of the Recycled Material Resource Center. That's directed by my colleague, Tensor Edel. Uh, and uh, I'm the director of our Office of Sustainability on campus these days, but the, the two are tightly coupled together and, and uh, collaborate on a lot of things. There, some of you may be involved with um, um, state DOTs that are engaged with uh, uh, Recycled Materials Resource Center. We're in our third generation. Historically, the Recycled Materials Resource Center was a joint venture between the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the University of New Hampshire. And in this latest uh, uh, rendition of the Recycled Materials Resource Center, which it's just at University of Wisconsin these days, although Kevin Gardner of University of New Hampshire is, still, is on our board and uh, also be participating in a variety of different research uh, initiatives as we go forward. But, but you may hear from Tensor or me regarding the Recycled Materials Resource Center sometime in the future. So what I want to talk about is using industrial byproducts in pavements uh, essentially as a sustainable construction material. But what, what I, while I'll talk about pavements, my application here, or my intent here really is to, to be a little bit broader, to talk about how we might use recycled materials in pavement infrastructure, but also just general sustainable infrastructure applications. So what I'll talk about is, is pavements oriented, but it applies more broadly. So if you could go to the next slide. I think one of the things we need to talk about in the context of recycled materials is in, in sustainability is why is this important? I want to have a little bit of a front end on this on my presentation because I think this is something we all need to think about. We, I think we uh, as an industry have 
done a lot to promote recycled materials uh, as kind of being the right thing to do or perhaps as a way to save money. But I think there's actually a more compelling reason to think about recycled materials in the context of sustainability. If you um, look at things that have been going on in the world with rapid growth actually outside our country, you know, the, gro the population growth and the economic growth that's going on worldwide is, is outside the U.S. largely. It's in China, it's in India, large growth in population, but also importantly as well, growth in quality of life. And with quality of life comes consumption, and consumption means energy use, raw material use, emissions, all the things that we're used to having and incurring in our country are incurring, are being incurred at other parts of the world but at a scale that's so much larger than we can ever imagine from our own history because we're really a small part of the world population at, at roughly about 0.3 billion now and maybe 0.5 billion in the next century. The, the rest of the world's going to be 10, 11 billion. Uh, so we're going to be a small part of it. And perhaps which is, is most startling is that the projections are in the next uh, uh, 20 years or so, our economy is going to be the third largest in the world. And so our ability to essentially dominate the world marketplace for energy and, and raw materials resources is going to change dramatically just by market power. We know that the biggest players in any given market tend to be able to dominate the way that the market behaves. And our ability to dominate uh, world markets as a nation is going to change. And we need to think about how we adjust our practices in our country uh, so that we have the energy resources and the raw material resources to, to uh, maintain the quality of life that we expect in our nation. And I think that's, that's one of the big reasons why we think about recycled materials, as I'll in indicate in a minute. Let's, let's go to the next slide, because I think this slide I'm going to show now is, is pretty remarkable. I clipped this out of the Wall Street Journal last year. Uh, this just talks about uh, automobile production in China. Uh, you know, within like the next six to eight years, China is planning on building 33 million cars per year uh, just for domestic consumption. We produce about 11 million in the United States, so three times as many as we do in the U.S. That's just remarkable, and that's just one segment of the industrial production and consumption going on in a country that is nowhere near the terms of quality of life standards that we expect and is very much so desiring to have the same things we have. Clearly we're going to have resource constraints. Finding better ways to use our resources is going to be imperative, including recycling. Go to the next slide, please. So how does this fit into infrastructure and, and pavement construction and, and highways? Um, well, it, there's significant benefits that we can attain through recycled materials. First, we can reduce the en en excuse me, energy consumed in construction and rehabilitation. We can actually chop the energy that we use to uh, build roadways by a factor of a half to, a, uh, to two thirds. The same with emissions. We can cut emissions, particularly uh, greenhouse gas emissions, 50 percent, 70 percent through using recycled materials in construction. And I will show an example of that as we go through. Reduce consumption of natural resources. We, we think of Portland cement concrete. Uh, por cement that goes into Portland cement concrete is actually uh, sold on the world marketplace, for one. So it is a worldwide commodity, which we will have to compete for. And if you remember, before the recession, cement prices had gone up substantially due to worldwide demand. Uh, but cement's also the uh, largest non-transportation driven greenhouse gas source worldwide, producing Portland cement. The ways that we can replace things like Portland cement have both affect our natural resource consumption, our energy, and our uh, emissions. Perhaps one of the really great attributes too that's a, a benefit is that oftentimes using recycled materials, we can actually build a pavement structure uh, better. And as a result, we can increase the service life. Uh, we're not necessarily, by using a recycled material, degrading it. We're actually making it better. Next slide, please. So how do recycled materials fit into this? Um, well, one of the largest sources of energy and emissions associated with construct road, roadway construction is not the actual trucks and the movement of the materials on the job site. It's actually the, the mining and processing of the materials of construction themselves. 
that's where most of the energy and emissions comes in. For example, blasting rock, crushing rock, preparing it for uh, use in base, as an example. Uh, we avoid the use of a natural resource. So we don't have to, for example, we might avoid mining sand and gravel for an application. We, uh, not only do we uh, have the benefits of not using the energy and creating the emissions associated with mining, uh, we also don't affect the hydrology and the natural environment. Limestone oil uh, resources are, are similar as well. And as I indicated, we can actually increase service life. Uh, we don't necessarily make an infrastructure landfill, but we can actually make better and longer lasting infrastructure. Just because a, a construction material has been used in something before, doesn't necessarily mean it's inferior. In fact, it can be inferior, in, uh, superior, and I'll show that in a minute. Go ahead, next slide. So what kind of byproducts do we have in North America, recycled materials that we might use in large volume uh, roadway type of construction projects? Uh, coal combustion products, these have got a lot of brouhaha with all the EPA stuff going on right now, but uh, fly ash in particular, uh, both cementitious and non-cementitious fly ashes can be great construction materials. Bottom ash and boiler slag being used as, as materials um, like sands. Scrubber sludges can be used in some cases as fill. Uh, iron foundry byproducts, if you're in the you know, parts of uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Indiana, Lots of locations where uh, slags and uh, casting sands are frequently discarded and they can be actually reused in construction projects wonderfully as structural fill or aggregate and hot mix asphalt uh, used in, in sub-base or base, lots of applications. Uh, concrete and asphalt from demolition, uh, great applications for that using recycled concrete aggregate as base course or in, in new concrete and recycled uh, uh, asphalt pavement as well as both in, in asphalt or in base course. And I'll give you a base course example in a minute. Pulp and paper industry as well, paper mill residuals, good. We, we saw some really good discussion about uh, using organic materials on, on uh, roadway landscape applications in the previous presentation. Paper mill sludges fit into that well. Uh, rubber and scrap tires is an area that's been used uh, extensively for lightweight fills and for uh, sound barriers, and then an the, uh, area which get a lot of attention lately is uh, recycled asphalt shingles, both being primarily used in hot mix asphalt, but also being used in, uh, in uh, structural fill as well. So that's just some photographs. When you look at many of these materials, if you didn't know they were an industrial byproduct, you might not think they were an industrial byproduct. They look like the same type of stuff that we actually use in construction already. I mean, if you look in the upper left-hand corner, for example, uh, that's a, a recycled concrete aggregate from a building demolition project. You can see some brick in there. Kind of looks like a well-graded gravelly sand. If we go directly below that, the left middle, uh, that's a, uh, a bottom ash from a coal-fired utility. Looks like sand. It actually feels a lot like sand. The specific gravity is a little lighter. If we go all the way over to the right, in the upper right-hand corner, we see a slag, looks like a pea gravel. In the middle on the right, we see a foundry sand. It's just a dark colored sand. And in the lower right is actually a, a, bit, a blend of recycled uh, concrete with a little bit of recycled asphalt pavement mixed into it. These all look like granular or fine textured construction materials we would normally use. In fact, uh, they can be used very logically in place of uh, fresh materials. Or, or new natural construction materials. So next slide, please. They look like the right materials. In fact, they can be just as good as or better than the other materials. So we always talk about um, what we call the safe and wise uh, approach. And I think I, I'm, I'm missing a slide. Was there one right before this about safe and wise applications? I wonder if I deleted it by accident. Yeah, I must have. I apologize. Um, we talk about the safe and wise principle, that we need to look at whether something's wise and then whether it's environmentally safe. By wise, when we look at industrial byproducts or recycled materials, we're really asking ourselves, are these materials going to provide the same type of engineering behavior and quality performance that we expect with the traditional conventional construction materials we use? For example, if we replace a 
crushed aggregate base with a base made out of recycled concrete aggregate, is it going to provide the same stiffness or resilient modulus? Is it going to provide the same durability, the same drainage? Will it function effectively as an engineering application? And the way we evaluate that is, is very simple. Well, we run the same types of tests on that material as we would run our, on our conventional engineering design material. For example, we might uh, measure the resilient modulus, California bearing ratio. We might look at freeze-thaw and wet-dry durability. Uh, we might look at hydraulic conductivity for drainage. We go through the same series of design and evaluation steps that we would go through with an, uh, a conventional material. It's important, though, that we go through the engineering evaluation step, not just, for example, looking at whether it has the same particle gradation. We actually have to look at the engineering properties because particle gradation itself may not be sufficient. So we actually have to engineer uh, with this new material. And, and this is an area where uh, mistakes often happen and we, where we can have, a, for example, an application of a byproduct that isn't wise because it, it really didn't fit in the application. For example, maybe it has the same particle size distribution as a base course uh, uh, that's normally used in construction, but it doesn't have the same s strength and stiffness that we would normally specify that goes into a, for example, mechanistic empirical pavement design. Um, so you have to do the engineering, and that's the wise part of it. We need to make wise choices. We need to make sure that the engineering properties of these materials are adequate to meet the design goal. And skipping this step is often where problems arise. And it's critical if you're going to use recycled materials in construction that you do the engineering, uh, not just look at whether it fits uh, construction specs, but actually do the engineering with it, test the engineering property. So the, the safe part of it's important as well, and this is another area where we need to be careful um, because we're, we're dealing with materials that are uh, byproducts of other industrial processes in many cases, uh, we want to make sure that what we're doing won't have an ad adverse effect on the environment. Normally, we're talking about uh, impacts on, on water resources, either groundwater or surface water. Occasionally, it's air, but it's almost always water. From my, many of the uh, projects I've been in, it's always been water resource related. And this is another area where we need to be thoughtful. Um, we, if we're going to use a recycled material, we want to actually test it to make sure that it fits environmentally. Uh, and this is an area where when tests aren't done on the material and it's used without kind of doing a thoughtful environmental analysis, um, mistakes happen and uh, applications are inappropriate. And then recycled materials get a bad name. I, I can think of some with for example, applications of slag, uh, of slags from the cast iron industry, where the environmental analysis wasn't conducted. They tend to be generate liquids that are a little more alkaline when water contacts them. They have higher pH. Some applications that's not acceptable, uh, and knowing that at the beginning is important. And and there's methods to do this. Uh, a very common method is a batch method called ASTMD. 3987, essentially you put the solid material in a jar of water, you shake it up, and then you look at the constituents that dissolve in that water. There's also some new EPA methods coming out, for example, EPA method 1313. And there's a whole new EPA methodology that David Cawson and his colleagues at Vanderbilt University have been developing called the Leaching Environmental Assessment Framework that's being uh, developed and published by EPA and which will be available. It's a pretty rigorous and comprehensive uh, process, but it's, it's also a very thoughtful procedure. Uh, we, in our state, we've used the water leach test D3987 in the context of our Wisconsin Administrative Code with great success and without any, not a single, um, uh, problematic uh, industrial byproducts application in construction in our state history. We've had the uh, NR 538 code since the uh, middle of the 1990s. This is a, uh, a state administrative regulation that essentially defines how industrial byproducts are used in construction application, including roadways, but in any application. Uh, it tends to be conservative. Uh, we run a uh, water leach test, a batch test, like I talked about in the previous slide, and we also look at the total elemental analysis, or essentially the chemical makeup of the material. 
we go through a series of tables in that that uh, code, and the byproducts are, are put into categories best based on the test data, and then the categories define suitable applications. It's a very conservative approach, and also uh, has worked exceptionally well in our state. Again, as I indicated, we haven't had one case of an industrial byproduct used in construction in the context of NR538 code where we've had an environmental problem. So this is a great example. If your state doesn't have something like this, this is a good example that you can use in, in, with confidence. And you can download it for free at the website I show at the bottom of the slides. So I want to give you an, a case history, an example of uh, where we use two industrial byproducts together in lieu of a, a conventional construction material, uh, created a product that, uh, uh, well, I, I won't tell the story. I'll just, I'll, as we go along, I'll, I'll fill you in. But we use two materials that are shown on this slide. Uh, one of these, what we call reclaimed pavement material. It's like recycled asphalt pavement, uh, but it's got some base course in it. It's got some subgrade. Some people call this dirty wrap or dirty recycled asphalt pavement. It comes from, uh, um, essentially milling the um, um, uh, existing um, road reclaiming the existing hot mix asphalt base course and subgrade like you would do for example if you're familiar with full depth reclamation that creates this dirty wrap material that, that, that you might think of as being acceptable for base course but often is considered to be inferior to a crushed rock it just looks dirty it looks kind of weak and soft uh, compared to crushed rock, and so the perception is that that RPM itself wouldn't be acceptable as a, a base course material. And then there's a material on the right, that kind of powdery material. That's a high carbon fly ash uh, from an electric power utility, coal-fired utility, and it has too much carbon in it to use it in concrete as a cementitious material because it would affect the air and training agents. And so it's actually landfilled in large quantities, even though it's got great cementitious properties. So in this particular project, we took the high carbon fly ash, which is put in a landfill, and this reclaimed pavement material, which is supposedly inferior, blended them together with the intent of creating a, a, a stiff and durable highway base course material. And the idea being we take the cementitious ash, mix it with the reclaimed pavement material, that would essentially uh, counter with the apparent low strength and stiffness of that re RPM and make it strong and stiff and therefore viable. So that was, that was the uh, uh, intent of this project. So we evaluated this up at uh, the state of Minnesota's Minroad Test Facility. This is a fantastic facility. It's, it's really the best in the country to look at full-scale pavement applications in a research environment. We built three full-scale test sections of the roadway at Minroad. The one on the left is a conventional construction where the base course is 200 millimeters of crushed aggregate, standard crushed aggregate used in, in Minnesota. We also designed then two other sections which were intended to be at least as, uh, as um, had the, at least this, uh, the same structural number or larger than the conventional section. The middle one, which we call a sustainable re alternative, we replaced that crushed aggregate with RPM. And our design would suggest it should be, be at least as good as or better than when we use our engineering properties in the analysis. And then finally on the right, a, uh, a design with uh, reclaimed pavement material where we've added in 14% of that high carbon fly ash that normally goes in the landfill and that's a cementing material. So we've taken two byproducts and created something that even has a higher structural number. So let's look at how effective these materials were in terms of uh, uh, base course materials, and then let's look at some of the sustainability metrics associated with it. So this is a, a graph just showing the relative stiffness of these materials. So you can imagine what you want for a base course. You want it to be stiff so that it supports the asphalt. The stiffer it is or the higher its modulus, the better it supports the asphalt, the less the asphalt flexes under load, and the uh, longer the pavement lasts. And the perception, of course, is that, for example, this RPM, this dirty wrap, is inferior to crushed aggregate. And if you look at this graph, you would see perception and reality are different. The RPM actually has higher modulus than crushed aggregate. The RPM is stiffer. So immediately, the recycled material is thought to be inferior, but this graph would show it's superior because it has higher stiffness. So there are some issues with rutting RPM, which are important. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, 
but in the right, we take the RPM and we mix it with the fly ash. It cements it some, it stiffens it up. Remarkable, remarkable increase in stiffness. It's a much stiffer base course. So we actually create something that's stronger and stiffer and actually has greater durability and lifespan than the conventional product. Well, let's look at some of the other aspects of this. Let's look at life cycle analysis. We can use tools like this to measure and compute energy usage, greenhouse gases, example, uh, other sustainability metrics. This graph shows energy consumption through construction. All right, this isn't life cycle, total life cycle, just through the construction life cycle. And what you see is the alternative materials use a half to 25% of the energy of conventional construction. It's remarkable, and most of it's through materials production. The reduction in energy associated with creating the materials, not actually placing them, but actually creating them. If you look at this through the entire life cycle of the roadway, the actually the RPM plus fly ash ends up having the total lower lowest energy usage because the roadway lasts longer. Over a 50-year period, we do one less rehabilitation with RPM and fly ash uh, over the entire life cycle. So tremendous energy savings. Next slide, please. Same thing with greenhouse gas emissions. Looks almost identical type of graph. The highest greenhouse gas emissions are conventional construction. By using recycled materials, uh, we end up with, uh, this is through construction again, about 50 to 60% uh, lower uh, greenhouse gas emissions. If we look at it over the total life cycle, the RPM plus fly ash is actually the lowest when we consider the whole life cycle of pavement, largely because we have one less rehabilitation cycle within a 50-year window. So those are the traditional sustainability metrics. One of the big issues with recycled materials is groundwater. Uh, and uh, this is, again, uh, often a perception issue. If we engineer it properly, we do the proper testing prior to construction, groundwater issues are fairly modest, uh, if inconsequential. Um, and uh, uh, one of the ways we've looked at that is by building lysimeters underneath roadways, essentially a big pan under the roadway to collect liquid which drips through the, the roadway infrastructure and then gets uh, collected in a, in a drum that's buried and then we can look at the chemical constituents and the volume of flow in that drum and compare them to uh, uh, water quality standards. We can compare them to the conventional construction and the like. And what we found in general is with uh, essentially all the industrial byproducts we use, we really don't see any statistically significant differences from conventional construction materials. You know, this is just an example of one of these lysimeters being built. You can see in the upper left, we're actually welding this plastic pan underneath. It's made out of a GM membrane underneath the roadway. We've got a, a little sump in the corner where all the liquid flows, and we designed these so all the liquid that hits the, the pan actually gets drained immediately to the sump. And lower right-hand corner, we're putting a drainage uh, net and fabric over, over the GM membrane. And then we're using that wonderful construction material called duct tape which solves all construction problems. And then on the, the lower left, you see the tank being installed. And just to give you some picture of what these look like. And here's some data. And if you look at this graph, we'll just talk about it briefly here. But there's two things that are important in this graph. First of all, if we look at the data, and this shows you conventional crushed aggregate, that CA, RPM, and RPM plus fly ash. This is for our min dot, uh, our, excuse me, our min room project. All of these data uh, and its concentration as a function of what we call poor volumes of flow, but it might as well just be time on the lower axis. The data look about the same. There's really no greater concentration of mercury, for example, in the industrial byproducts than the conventional materials. All the concentrations look about the same. And in fact, if you looked at it carefully, you might be able to make an argument that the conventional construction material has the highest mercury leaching uh, associated with it. Practically, though, they're no different. Most importantly, though, they're, they're 100 times lower than the water quality standard, 100 times. Uh, and so the impact or the, the health threat at the very bottom of the pavement, not at a drinking water well, but at the very bottom of the pavement, is insignificant. And so we can do this type of analysis to look at uh, environmental protection as well. And that, well, the other thing that we've developed are some models that allow you to to input uh, environmental data and look at potential consequences. For example, we have a model called WISC leach 
actually just developed and uh, released a two-dimensional version of this, which is available on our website for free. That's at the bottom of the page. And, and this model, just a computational model, runs on a PC or runs on the web uh, to uh, uh, calculate uh, how uh, leaching from byproducts might affect groundwater. And it's a mechanical model, and, and you can look on the website if you want some more information. But this is readily available to address regulatory questions, and it's free. Next slide. You'll see this the way it works. This has these strips, so it's actually calculating the essentially the water flowing down through the unsaturated zone and, and contaminants as well. So one of the things that we've been interested in doing is creating ways that we can actually quantify these various aspects in a sustainability series of sustainability metrics. And RMRC uh, has developed this best in highways sustainability rating system that will actually go through your project and calculate all the sustainability metrics associated with it. Do the life cycle analysis, do a life cycle costing, uh, look at a whole series of different sustainability metrics and rate your project and provide this type of quantitative information that tells you about the sustainability benefits associated with uh, using recycled materials at construction. Next slide. And this is free too, available on our website. And it's and this just gives you a little bit of a sense of what it does, but it usually uses primarily life cycle analysis and life cycle cost analysis to look at different alternatives. Perhaps most important, it's quantitative and it's auditable so that somebody else can actually check what you've done and you can publish and use these, the data from this in a very reliable way. And just to give you an example, we did a, a, a case history of this looking at coal combustion products. You know, there's been, as mentioned earlier, a lot of brouhaha about coal combustion products and their environmental impacts and there's actually a push to make them hazardous waste which would eliminate their use in, in uh, construction applications and so one of the things that we did for Congress was to look at one of the implications of if we ban coal combustion products in recycled construction application what would be the impacts for the nation and we use best in highways for this and this gives you some example of the energy equivalent of, of 1.7 million households, so a pretty large city, 31% uh, of domestic water withdrawals in California, that's a lot of, you know, 11 million people. Um, carbon emissions of nearly 2 million passenger cars per year from the roadways, and then perhaps most importantly as we talk about budgets and taxes and everything in our nation with our, our election coming up, a fiscal impact of between five and ten billion dollars on the economy. So decisions about using these materials have actually very large consequences and you can use these kind of tools to make a quantitative assessment. We, we actually did this for Congress so that it helped them make a thoughtful decision. Um, we'll see if that happens I guess. I think that's all I've got. Just some take-home messages. Uh, Recycled materials is more than doing just the right thing. It's about energy, it's about resources, and it's about cost. It, uh, we, there's lots of uh, benefits in terms of energy and emissions and resource use that we can obtain. We can also create longer lasting infrastructure. Just because we reuse a recycled material doesn't mean it's a inferior product. We can actually create a better product. The really important part is about perception and reality are often different. We can use the quantitative engineering and, it, and quantitative analysis to look at alternatives and draw very logical and thoughtful conclusions about whether we should use these materials in the first place safe and wise, and if we do use them, what are the sustainability benefits associated with them. Um, and I can't emphasize it enough, it, it's really important to, to think about safe and wise, to do the analysis, and to use good engineering practice to ensure that we we use these materials reliably. So that's all I've got. Uh, I think you've kind of seen a, a front to back end of the sustainable issues associated with this. I'd just like to put this graph in. I know sustainability is quite a buzzword these days, and at some point the use of the word sustainable will become unsustainable because it'll be the only word used in our language. <laughs> if you've seen this graph before, it's kind of silly. I'll leave it with that. Okay, thank you, Craig. Okay, having recently retired from public service, Barry Cogburn is the former director of the Landscape and Enhancement Section Design Division of the Texas Department of Transportation. Barry began her career with the Texas Department of Transportation in 1986 
as a district landscape architect for the Austin office. In her position prior to retirement, she was responsible for developing, directing, and overseeing statewide policies, procedures, and administrative rules for landscape architecture and aesthetic design for Texas DOT. Other duties include administration of the department's statewide landscape programs and the federally funded transportation enhancement program. In 1998, she began a partnership with the Texas Commission of Environmental Quality, which focused on research, development, and implementation of utilizing compost as an effective erosion control alternative in highway construction and maintenance. This partnership effort resulted in one of the most progressive compost utilization programs in the country and included the largest Clean Water Act grant ever awarded by the EPA. The effort was awarded the 2002 American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials President's Transportation Award and the 2002 National Par Partnership for Highway Quality, Texas Quality Initiative, Making a Difference Award. Today, TxDOT is the nation's largest market for compost. At their national conference in January of 2012, the U.S. Composting Council presented Barry with the 2011 Clean Water Award. Barry holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Landscape Architecture from Texas A&M University. She became an RLA in 1987, has served for several years on the Professional Advisory Board for the Department of Landscape Architecture at Texas A&M University. Barry was a recipient of the 2003 Raymond Stotzer Award for Outstanding Leadership dedication and service to the state in the field of transportation. She's a graduate of the Leadership Texas Class of 2008, an active member of Executive Women in Texas Government, and she was named the EWTG's 2009 Woman of the Year and served as president of the organization in 2011. Okay, Barry, you're on. Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for tuning in. I have kind of condensed an hour presentation into about 20 minutes, so I'm going to move fairly quickly. Um, it's interesting, I think, to start off uh, the presentation and kind of set the scene for why the agency would want to use compost. Certainly as a landscape architect, I've always utilized compost in my landscape projects, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking highway construction. So let's look at the first slide here and we'll get started with a little background on what I'm talking about. Here's a great shot of a highway right-of-way during highway construction. Obviously the lanes to the right have been open to traffic, but you can see that's some newly laid asphalt. Typically what we've got in at least my area of Central Texas is a very um, hard-packed caliche road-based material. And of course, those of you uh, involved in the highway industry probably know that what's holding up the road is not the best uh, uh, medium for growing grass. But growing grass or, or, or native uh, establishment on the side of this road is very important because that's what's handling the water that comes off the road. So that right-of-way, what, what we're talking about between the pavement and usually the, the adjacent property owners is a very important feature of the highway system. Again, it's carrying water quickly. And the best way to convey that water is over quickly established grass. But here what you see is the road grade has been uh, brought up. And what we're doing is typically putting down four inches of topsoil. Next, what we would typically do would be to roll out a wood fiber blanket over the newly planted grass seed and water the heck out of it. If it's got any slope to it, we would use a wood fiber blanket. If it's a fairly flat area, we would use a wood fiber mulch. But what happens if you don't get enough rainfall, either from Mother Nature or from a water truck, such as is shown in this picture, you get what you'll see in the next slide. Severe erosion. Here's a picture of some erosion next to a headwall and some very sandy soil. And you can see that what's going to happen over time, if this is allowed to progress any further, you're going to undermine that concrete slope, that riprap slope, and then you're getting into some major maintenance dollars to correct the situation. Here's another picture of some severe erosion. Look how deep those gullies are. This is going to be very expensive for the contractor to redo, reapply seed and fertilizer, reapply 
wood fiber blankets or mulch. It's going to be very expensive, and it gets the DOT into a lot of trouble, potentially with the EPA. Here's a picture of some erosion I spotted that went on for miles and miles. In the back of this picture, you can see a few hay bales, but that was the only control that I noticed for about a mile in either direction. It's just not adequate to capture the velocity of the, ro of the rainfall that is coming down this, this swale here. And over the years, I noticed that there could be many reasons for this. Sometimes the grass was planted at the wrong time of year. Sometimes there was not adequate rainfall or adequate irrigation from a water truck or sometimes the deluge of rainfall would just wash away all of the grass seed and mulch component before the grass itself had had a chance to get established. But the biggest thing I noticed was it often seemed like the topsoil that we were importing to the job site was void of organic matter in my um, job uh, in the vegetation management area in my early days of the career, I found out that the places where we were getting topsoil weren't usually uh, good places. I would be taken by the contractor out to the side of the, uh, out to the edge of town and he'd say, well, he'd point down to a pit, a deep pit and say, well, that's where I got my topsoil. Now, I'm a landscape architect, not a soil scientist, but I knew that true topsoil was that top layer of soil that contained the organic matter that was needed for grass establishment. So what we were getting was not true topsoil. It wasn't really a surprise when it all washed away, but it was very expensive for our agency and for our contractors. So in 1996, I was invited to, of all things, a master composter training workshop. And I thought to myself, well, I'm a landscape architect. I know everything about compost. But indeed, I did not. At this workshop that was presented by my state's DEQ, which is the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, I really learned more about compost. And I learned how TCEQ was working with many municipalities to talk them into composting their organic waste that half of what we put into a landfill in the summertime is actually organic material that could be made into a value-added product of compost. So they were advocating compost, and I kept hearing about organic matter, the word organic matter, and it suddenly dawned on me that we needed to get together. So at this master compost workshop, I worked, I met the person who was to be my colleague for the next few years, Scott McCoy from the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Again, I kept hearing how organic matter was filling up our landfills and how new landfills were so difficult to permit. And I thought, gee, you know, we don't have enough organic matter. They've got too much. We've got to find a way to meet in the middle. Well, Scott and I met many times after that conference, and we got our heads together and we thought, how, is, how could DOT actually utilize this material? And we invited a couple of our area engineers to sit on an informal committee with us. And they told us, you're onto something here. This sounds like something we might try, but we've got to have a way to pay for it. What we need you to do is to write a specification. Well, at that time in my career, I, I hadn't done much of that, and I thought, well, how hard could it be? It was actually um, a very involved process, but we invited members of the compost industry to sit on this informal committee, and they were a wealth of, of knowledge. They gave us lots of good input, lots of good ideas, and in 1998, we had a specification. The next thing Scott and I decided to do was take it out to the field and show our engineers and our highway contractors how well this material really could work. And in the early days, we had an informal workshop and a demonstration that we would show folks. Next slide. <clears throat> At these demonstrations, I would agree to get our engineers and highway contractors out there and my colleague Scott McCoy, who had a little grant money, would find a local compost supplier and an applicator to actually apply the material. What we would ask the engineers was, 
where is your toughest spot? Where do you have some erosion? Where do you have some problems establishing vegetation? That's what we want. Then we'd all go out there. We'd use the proper traffic control. We would invite the press. We would invite um, local elected officials to come out and see how well this product could work. Because we knew that unless we got the municipalities interested, we might not have an adequate source of material. We also had a logo to kind of brand our effort, if you will. We use this logo on every presentation we do, on many handouts, and we would go all over demonstrating the unique aspects of this material. We also had a vibrant website at the time that tried to educate designers and engineers on everything they needed to know about compost. We wanted to be really careful that we were just giving them a basic overview, however. We didn't intend for them to become soil specialists, but we did need to make them understand the material well enough so that should an, ad an adjacent property owner perhaps have questions about what was being applied, that they'd have a basic working knowledge. At that time, we went to trade shows all over the state. Um, the Associated General Contractors Trade Show, um, the International uh, Vegetation Management Trade Show, all in an effort to not only educate our designers, but educate our roadway contractors about using the material. Sure, the roadway contractors are going to utilize whatever they're told to in a, in a project bid, but we wanted them to feel comfortable about what the compost was. We also were very careful anytime we received some uh, attaboy letter, I like to call them, or um, of something that supported the effort to make copies of it and send it to others that were maybe thinking about using it and maybe hadn't quite made the decision to do so yet, but we got some great support from EPA and FHWA and other TxDOT area engineers. Next slide, please. We also wrote and were interviewed for several articles in major trade publications, and that really did a lot to advance our message. So basically, what we want to get across to folks in a simple way is that compost is very good for several main reasons. First of all, compost can improve any kind of soil. It quickly establishes vegetation, which is your number one goal in SW3P. And finally, it avoids erosion. Next slide. Well, how does it do that? How is it really growing grass faster? Well, number one, it, it returns that needed organic matter to the soil. So any kind of soil can be improved with the addition of compost. If you've got a sandy soil that's draining too quickly, compost helps add porosity and holds on to that available moisture just a little bit longer. If you've got a clay soil that's not draining at all, compost opens it up and lets that water move on through. So it truly does change the structure of any soil. Here's a great picture showing that. The soil on the left is a very tight clay soil, and the soil that you see on the right is that very same clay soil, but it's been amended with compost. Look how friable it is. It's going to um, aid vegetation establishment greatly. Well, in, in TxDOT's specification, which by the way, you can go online and do a Google search for TxDOT compost spec specification, the number is 161. We decided to be very broad in writing a specification and allow any feedstock for compost that was made in many parts of our state. Of course, a lot of municipalities were composting, so leaves and yard trimmings make a great feedstock. Food scraps make a great food, uh, feedstock. Out of date, liquor and beer, strangely enough, makes a great feedstock that a lot of composters use. Um, milk byproducts. Um, anytime um, uh, a, a dairy is making milk, they're spinning off the milk fat. That makes a great feedstock. 
food processing residues from that industry. Manure is important in Texas because we've got a huge feedlot industry in our panhandle. We also have um, a large poultry production. We've also got lots of dairies in our central part of our state, so dairy manure was very important. And lastly, but certainly not leastly, is Class A biosolids. Many of our municipalities or composting their Class A biosolids, and uh, personally, that's my favorite kind of compost. Compost, it's great stuff. Here's a slide of compost being made. Uh, many of you may already know about this, but I include this in my in my um, workshops just to show our engineers and design folks what compost is and what it's not. Here's a picture of a windrow operation. This machine is very important because it's incorporating air and um, air and water into the pile. So I like to tell folks, you know, this is really just the same kind of compost your grandmother probably used in her garden. It is and it isn't. What's important about this operation here, and we'll go to the next slide, is that this compost has to undergo the EPA time and temperature requirements. And to do that, the compost has to heat up to 132 degrees, and it's got to stay that hot for 15 days. And that's going to kill off any pathogens that might be harmful to humans. What I also wanted to impress upon our folks was that compost was not a raw sewage, sludge, or manure product at all. Here's a slide of a facility I visited in another state that accepted uh, mixed municipal solid waste. We would not allow that in our textot compost specification. So compost is not utilizing any raw sewage or mixed municipal solid waste. But what it is, is a pasteurized, pathogen-free, organic soil amendment. Again, as I said, this compost has been heated, heated up to a temperature of at least 132 degrees and has to stay this hot for 15 days with a minimum of five turnings. This makes sure that we don't have any harmful pathogens and it ensures that we get the, only the highest quality compost. Well, we've been using that specification for a couple of years when we began a great association with the U.S. Composting Council. About that time, the U.S. Composting Council was developing their own test methods called the Testing Methods for the Examination of Composting and Compost, TMECC. And we decided to rewrite our specification and acknowledge those test methods. We had previously used some ASTM test methods, and that was great to get us started, but compost is a living, changing um, material, so this TMECC test methods worked so much better. The other part of the spec that really helped us out at that time was making sure that all the compost we used, our spec called for it to be seal of testing assurance certified by the U.S. Composting Council. And that took, if you will, kind of the inspection monkey off our back. Number one, when a compost is brought out to the job site and the inspector's taking a look at it, he's gonna wanna see a data sheet like you see in front of you here. This is a FTA um, technical data sheet for compost and it's easier for him to check the material against the specification. So basically, I'm going to go over the three ways that you can specify compost because there are materials that can help you in a variety of ways. First of all, we have compost manufactured topsoil, then erosion control compost, and general use compost. Those are the three ways that compost can be specified under item 161. Here we go. As I mentioned before when I first started, TxDOT usually imports topsoil, or sometimes if there's decent soil available on the job site, we kind of peel that back and stockpile it while the job is being built, then we come back and blade it back out. In that case where we had pretty decent topsoil but it had been stockpiled, we'd blade it out to about three inches, 
then the contractor would bring in an inch of compost over the top to give us what we're calling compost manufactured topsoil, which under the spec is 75% soil and 25% compost. So that's four inches of compost manufactured topsoil. How about you've got some pretty good soil already on your job site existing and you just need to bring in compost over the top. This would be what we're, call, what we're calling compost manufactured topsoil blended in place. Next slide. And when you're using blended in place compost manufactured topsoil, the contractor would need to bring a disc in over the top. You know, you'd want to incorporate that existing soil with the compost that's been put on the top of it just to prepare that seed bed. So again, you've got four inches of compost manufactured topsoil blended in place. Next, we're going to talk about erosion control compost. Say perhaps you have a sloped area that is prone to erosion. If you've got a slope, you're going to need some component in that compost to, number one, take the impact of any direct rainfall. So in that case, we mix half compost with half wood chips to have erosion control compost. That can be applied pneumatically, as you see this operator here. It can also be applied with a blade. A uh, good blade man can get it down any depth that you might need. Lastly, oh, this is another slide, excuse me, of erosion control compost. You can see the portion of the slope on the middle of this picture showing the application of erosion control compost and on either side um, an untreated area. Lastly, you can specify compost, general use compost. This is 100% compost that I, as a landscape architect, would use in my planting mix, or most usually we would use it on established turf. One inch of compost over established turf in the spring is a wonderful fertilizer and it's worked very well for us. I've got a few pictures that we'll go through here quickly of demonstrations that we did out in the field. Our first one was in Dallas, Texas. Here was an area where the contractor had applied a wood fiber blanket. In fact, you can kind of see the remnants there of that blanket in the foreground, but had severe erosion. We came through there and our contractor blew in with pneumatic equipment a mixture of seed and erosion control compost. And if you'll keep your eye on that highway sign there, we'll go to the next slide which shows the same area a year later. Look at that thick, lush grass. It really worked out well for us. I have some dramatic pictures to show you. Uh, Floyd County, which is northeast of Lubbock, Texas, in our Panhandle region, it's a very dramatic landscape. What you've got going on here is a kind of a Caprock area. You might have heard of the Llano Estacado. Yeah, deep canyons, um, deep natural gullies, but as you can see in this picture, unfortunately we added to the present erosion. What they had happen was the contractor applied his seed, um, his few SW3P uh, components, a gully washer came through, washed it all away. You can see in the middle of this site um, the silt fence that's doing a, a pretty bad job of holding down all that erosion. What the contractor decided to do was completely rework the area with a series of riprap channels of rock gabion baskets that you see here. And then on the next slide, um, erosion control compost was added. This is that same site. You see the rock gabions in the middle, but to the right, between the rock gabions and the pavement, you see an application of erosion control compost. And the next slide shows that same site several months later completely vegetated, erosion is controlled. The next picture shows another before, if you will, on that same project, um, just the huge gullies that wash downhill. But the next slide shows um, that same area. The, the soil has been uh, brought back up to grade, covered with erosion control compost. Again, that combination of half compost, half wood chips and it's worked out very well. 
and there's a couple of more slides of this same project. Here we go. We've got some areas where water was going to move so quickly, so the designer went back, put in some concrete flumes there, but in the foreground you see the wood chips um, component of the erosion control compost. Here's that same site several months later. Grass is growing. You can still see a few of the wood chips sitting around. Another thing we decided to do was kind of attack the problems that we were having with silt fence, which, you know, sometimes worked, but more often didn't because they weren't cleaned or the rainfall event was, was, was just too much water coming through the silt fence for them to effectively work. So what we found out was you could use a material mixture of compost and wood chips and fill up these tubes, if you will, or what we call biodegradable erosion control logs. You can do that pneumatically. Um, contractors have been pretty ingenious in finding other ways to do it, but if you go to the next slide, you'll see another way in which they're used. Here's a erosion control log that's been laid across a little channel here, and you can see that sediment behind it that um, the compost uh, and, and wood chips have filtered that, the rainfall that has come through and really captured quite a lot of sediment. I think the beauty of this material is that at the end of the job site, when you do get your vegetation established, all the worker has to do is come by and kind of split that netting, if you will, and um, fling out the wood chips and compost, leave them in site, on site to um, completely biodegrade and do their job and your waste is really very little. This is a great product to use and we are seeing more and more job sites with this instead of the silt fence. Got just a few final slides here to kind of wrap up my presentation, but this is a good slide to show you the kinds of compost that the agency is using today. I'm really proud to say that we're using a lot of biosolids compost. Um, it, it's been great to watch a lot of cities really develop their composting operations after they found out that there was a big market in TechStop for us. So we are now using, I say we, I just retired a, a couple of months ago, but the agency is using up to 50% biosolids and yards trimming compost, then yard trimmings compost alone at 20%, and animal manure compost at 30%. Here's a great bar chart that kind of shows you where we've been um, when I started keeping records on the amount of compost specified. In 03, we were over 400,000 cubic yards. And through the years, we have kind of rounded off here to around 300,000 yards. But as of last year, we have surpassed using 3 million cubic yards of compost. So we're very proud of that. Here's some research that um, we were able to do with the effort, and it's um, a great way to show folks that it wasn't just Barry Cogburn and Scott McCoy telling people how well it worked. There was actually a lot of university research that looked at all kinds of things, compost logs, compost filter berms, even how to mitigate shoulder cracking on, on highways. So um, a lot of good things here to look at if you do a Google on TechStock Compost Research, you can easily find any of these, these research projects. So in summary, to wrap up, compost is wonderful. It's solving some really um, challenging environmental concerns. And we're very proud that we've become an end user for many of the project products that are produced, not just privately, but certainly municipally. And um, in doing so, it has really done great things for, for our PR. Let's face it, at the DOT, we, we, we just get a lot of bad PR because of the road building nature of what we do. But this was a way for us to do something good. Number one, it grew grass faster. It solved a lot of our problems. But it allowed our agency to become an in-market for the product itself. And that, that really was a good feeling. Just to wrap up, there is my contact information. I know I've gone through this very quickly, so if I can answer any questions or give you any future information, please do contact me here. 
Thank you, Wayne. And uh, we are now going to field some questions for our presenters. Again, if you have a question, uh, please enter it onto the GoToWebinar dialog box. Uh, we do have a few questions. And uh, the first one will be for Barry. Uh, the question is, do you take Class B biosolids as feedstock for composting? The short answer is no, absolutely not. <laughs> And I will, I will elaborate on that just a little bit. Class A can be sold to the general public. Class B cannot. They are um, uh, certain restrictions on Class B. I won't go into it right now, but the spec only allows Class A biosolids. Okay, thank you. I believe this question is for Craig. Uh, anything about RAS? Oh, recycled asphalt shingles. Yeah, good question. Um, I didn't include anything in the presentation, but uh, there's a lot of interest in, in RAS, um, both in HMA primarily in hot mix asphalt, but also uh, its use in, uh, in as structural fill. Um, I'm not an expert at hot mix asphalt. My colleague uh, Hussein Bahia does that work uh, in our department. But if you're interested, I can send you a report that we have on use of RAS in RAP and um, an HMA that was developed collaboratively between the Recycled uh, Materials Resource Center and the uh, Modified Asphalt Research Center here on campus, which are both FHWA-supported organizations. Uh, we also actually just completed a study on the use of RAS and structural fill, which you can use as lightweight structural fill in certain applications. Uh, you've got to pay attention to preloading of RAS to get some of the settlement out because it is it's a more compressible material but you can use it as a for example a, a wall back fill or a lightweight uh, uh, fill for an embankment if you're careful okay thank you uh, this question is for Barry are the biodegradable mesh logs ready available I've seen Filtrex compost sock products but don't know if they're patented or available from other sources the answer is yes, they are available from other sources. Um, I have seen some contractors secure their own uh, source for the mesh fabric. In fact, one contacted, I believe, the um, citrus growers in the southern part of our state and, and found something that was very similar to the bags that citrus is loaded into for sale at our grocery stores. But um, we have a specification for those um, erosion control logs as well. That number is 5049, and it outlines the types of materials that are acceptable. Okay, thank you. And uh, this next question, I believe this person knows, Barry. It is for the text, text compost queen. Which should come first, <laughs> compost specs or compost producers? Ooh, um, that was something that made us very nervous when we got started. We thought, you know, are we going to have enough people that can make this product? We certainly don't want to only have three vendors out there, but um, I think that you need to get a spec together first. You will find that the vendors will come. You know, we had a handful of vendors when we got started and now that we require the vendors to be STA certified, we're uh, in excess of 30 STA vendors in the state of Texas right now that I feel real good about because we've got a, a good geographic uh, distribution. So definitely get your spec together first. You've got to have a specification that, that outlines what it can and can't be before you can start using it. Okay. Question for Craig, and this is, uh, I believe, a two-part question. What steps are in place if the mercury leachate from the fly ash exceed acceptable standards? Will the surface have to be removed and repaved? And what kind of testing will occur for material delivered to site for mercury content? And who is liable for cleanup? Ooh, two big questions. Uh, first of all, the first question, uh, what, what would you do if the mercury concentration is too high? Now, we were doing a, a field study to look at this as part of a research project. So it's a little different. Uh, but if the mercury concentration is too high, you'll find that out as part of your design process through doing the wise, uh, the safe and wise, the safe part, 
of safe and wise, doing your leaching analysis. And if the mercury concentration is too high, don't use it. Uh, it would just not be logical or uh, prudent to do that because you would cause yourself potentially a problem. Um, if somebody brings a, a material to a job site that has a much higher, for example, mercury or any other concentration uh, to the job site than, than the test data that have been conducted uh, beforehand um, suggests, so if they bring a material that's out of spec, you might say, uh, that the person who delivers it is, is liable. Okay. Uh, question for Barry. It's really important to control materials to, at the plant or wherever they're being produced. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, question for Barry. Average price per ton paid by TxDOT to compost producers? Well, you're, I know the average price per cubic yard. <laughs> and, and, the, and the price per cubic yard is what we are paying the contractor to apply the material in place. So the price that the vendor would be getting would be a bit less, but the average price is about thirty dollars a yard installed. But again, that's what the contractor has bid to put the material in place. So he's getting it from a vendor, paying for it, and then putting it down for us, and we're paying him. I'm sorry, I couldn't speak to what the average cost per ton would be. But you can see it's still significant if we're paying a contractor thirty yards for a cube or thirty dollars for a cubic yard. Okay, thank you. And question for Craig, any other materials on the horizon for use in this application to keep a watch on? Mm. New materials. None that I can think of that are kind of emerging. We've been covering a lot of those that are kind of the high volume products that are available. Certainly there probably be things regionally that I'm perhaps not aware of. Yeah. I, I could add, uh, particularly for uh, rubber, uh, crumb rubber, uh, to be more exact. Uh, I know California is pretty much leading the country in use of crumb rubber in, in, uh, in surface materials. I know uh, PennDOT recently changed their specification for a crumb rubber modifier, uh, which is not a, uh, an aggregate replacement, but actually a a modifying a material to uh, help keep the uh, the liquid asphalt in suspension during paving. Uh, so I think there's there's a lot of potential there, particularly in in, in Pennsylvania. But uh, th that might be a future topic for for a webinar uh, to discuss separately. And uh, we have one more question for, uh, for Barry. What is the first step to get compost written into the specs for DOTs? Very good question. It is a very good question. And I would um, recommend that you find some, some co-workers that embrace trying something new. Um, as a landscape architect, it was very helpful for me to find some engineers that were willing to, to give it a try. Um, this was something new. It was something people rolled their eyes about. They thought you could never make this work. But I think by working with the engineers that are used to specifying things and having test methods that they can appreciate, I think that was key to making uh, our program so successful. And I'm not going to tell you it was easy. Writing a specification was very difficult especially when it came to the test methods that we used. You can write a specification and then you, you have to remember you've got the, the field individuals, the inspectors that, that need to understand it quickly and simply. So when we aligned ourselves with the U.S. Composting Council and adopted their TMECC test methods, that really went a long way towards helping our inspection staff. Okay, thank you. We're just about out of time. Uh, again, thank you, Barry and Craig, for your excellent presentations. Uh, this webinar, me. like all the webinars in this series, has been recorded and will be made available on both the National Recycling Coalition and Recycling Market Center websites. 
Um, again, thanks for joining us. We hope you'll join us for next month's webinar scheduled for Tuesday, December 18th, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And have a great day.